want to just give you a sense of what I was trying to do in The Code of Capital, the book that's mentioned here, and also what I'm trying to do in a forthcoming book that talks about capitalist law and just ratchets up the an analytical level um, one step. So in The Code of Capital, and I'm, I don't want to create too much pessimism in the room after we're starting to think about the future, but I also want to suggest that we can learn from the past. Um, I think one of my major um, points in the book is that law is not static. And the regime that we have is not static. But the point is that a certain set of relatively abstract institutions in the hands of powerful, resourceful players has recreated the same system over and over and over again. So there's an idea, and that is also written in most corporate, uh, in most property textbooks that you would read as a law student, that property rights are enumerated. There's only one set of property rights, and that these are endorsed by the state. You, know, you allocate them, and then the microeconomist can run with them, and you say you allocate them through contractual transactions. In fact, when you look into the evolution of property rights or other legal institutions, they are much more malleable than we think they are. And so the story of the code of capital is it's really all about the coding and the recoding um, of relations of power and control using a relatively small handful of legal institutions time and again, but applying them to different types of assets and to different social relations. It's a powerful machine. So what I'm basically saying, we have a handful of institutions that you just mentioned, property rights, collateral law, which is a category of property rights, corporate law, trust, bankruptcy, contract law. Not more than that you really need, there are more, but you can take those five or six legal institutions, and with them you can code land as capital, debt as capital, firms as capital, money as capital, Data is capital. I don't talk about data in the book, but you can. <laughs> so you can go on and on. Now it's, of course, nature. We've done land. Now we do nature, carbon offsets. We're co coding nature as capital with the same institutions. So the continuity of institutions, but their adaptability to different types of assets is cr critical for understanding. That both gives us, I think, hope and despair. Despair because it's just coming again and again and again and again. You don't know what to do about it because you're trying to catch them at one point and try to rein in the coding of capital. They're doing it again on another front. Hope because we could also learn from their script because you can also use existing institutions to code in different ways, to decode capital, recode social relations in a different, in, in a different manner. The key for me is that in order to um, uh, to, to understand how this works, we also have to realize that to scale these kind of new relations, we have to have some kind of um, um, enforceability. That's at least how the capital system has worked. So it's not only about property as such, but it's basically the ability to then enforce the priority rights that you're getting through property against the world. So I'm basically saying what these legal institutions that we mentioned do is they um, uh, give the holders of these assets priority over others. So I have stronger rights than you, I always win. Um, they, um, uh, they make certain interests durable because they create legal deals around asset pools, the trust, the corporation, and that enhances their durability, their lifetime, and the, the ability to accumulate wealth over time. Convertibility, that's sort of the contradiction or the paradox between durability and then and transferability in a way. Because convertibility means not just transferring, but being able to flip a shaky asset as an unsafe asset into a safer one. In other words, taking a financial asset and flipping it into money whenever you need to safety more than gains at a particular moment in time. So for financial assets, the key for wealth sustainability is actually convertibility. Being able to convert my assets into, into money is critical. And last not, but not least, this entire system is sustained by the um, possibility to invoke the coercive powers of the state to enforce these rights against others. So the third party, the um, external reach of these legal arrangements rests with the notion that these um, creatures will be res respected, vindicated, and enforced if necessary by a court of law. You don't always have to enforce, just the threat. Even in a first mover position, you can go out and say, this is legal, I just created something new, 
with these different tools that I can take out of the toolkit of lawyers, I create something new that I claim is legal. And if you don't think it's legal, you have to challenge me. That's the way our private law regime um, works. So we have a very, very powerful, strong mover advantages, which, which really means that we have, if you have resources, you can create these new things, you have lawyers to help create them, and, and then you can run with them. I've been teaching with a lawyer, a law and finance class for many years, and she always explained to my students, if you want to create a new financial assets that works, you have to treat all the existing rules and regulations as the scaffolding, and you have to find the gaps between the scaffolding to create this new new feature, this new creature of a financial asset, so it's enforceable. Because it, it's, if it's not enforceable, if it violate, violates any laws and regulations, it won't fly. Um, that's the work that lawyers um, do by and large. So this is how the system has evolved over time. And in the course of this evolution, of course, the legal institutions themselves have also been adapted to different types of assets. The players in the game of capitalism have been able to gain control over the basic rules of capitalism, have been able to redefine what property, property means, how contracts can be written, um, how to use the corporate veil or the trust uh, for their particular um, purposes. And I think we have to keep this in mind as well because as we play offense in trying to find new ways in, in organizing our societies, we also have to find, play defense because there's a lot of um, there are a lot of things going on on the other side at the same time. I'm just mentioning carbon offsetting. I've been at a similar meeting uh, in Vermont in January with uh, Vermont farmers who are fighting Wall Street. We're trying to acquire all the land to be able to do carbon offsetting rather than healing the land, for example. Let me just turn briefly to, um, to um, the, the, the second idea. So I'm just uh, finishing a new manuscript which I called Capital Law, C Capitalist Law which asks the simple question, why is it actually that a system that is coded in law as capitalism is so resistant to legal governance? Because it's not that we haven't tried. I think after World War II, after the Great Depression, actually a lot of attempts have been made, and for some time they've been quite successful to rein in capital. If you think about the New Deal, if you think about the idea of a social market economy as in Germany, if you bring in co-determination in or trying to stop capital, we had actually capital controls for a while, right? And then we didn't. It took only two, maximum three decades for capital to find its ways around the legal constraints that had been imposed. These are the, this is the legal scaffolding that had been in place. They can get around it. And why is that possible? Because quite fundamental, and here I'm going back to ideas that were uh, first formulated by socialist legal theorists, among them also Evgeny Pashokhanis, um, who was the first uh, major theorist of the, of the early Soviet Union, said capitalist law is essentially a, a lives of the opposite, the antithesis of private and public law. So public laws are constitutional law, our administrative law. Private law is how we organize our economic relations. The point is that private law was there first. Just as Jonathan Levy said, capitalism was there first, then came democracy. Private law was there first, then came constitutions, I would say. And constitutions don't say anything about private law other than saying we protect property. So however property is defined now has a constitutional valence and can be enforced even against the state, allegedly the founder of new legal structures and the endorser and vindicator of property rights that can be upheld against the state itself. And of course, as you all know, in the global um, world, we have extended the, the ability of private actors to hold states accountable through bilateral investment treaties, um, state in, um, um, investor dispute settlement mechanisms that allow them to enforce their rights in, in tribunals outside the territory of the state um, um, as well. So long story short, what I'm trying to tell in the second book is like more of the story, how can actually capital always come back? And I'm saying there are three, I'd say four features, one fun fundamental premise. In our societies, we give priority to private ordering over collective ordering. And then there are certain mechanisms in our legal systems that are deeply structural, structurally embedded um, in the system. One is the legal empowerment of private actors that follows directly from the premise I mentioned and is also embodied in our constitutional premises. The second is that while we always say the state has consolidated the means of coercion, we have a system that allows highly decentralized access to the means of coercion and we call this litigation or the execution of arbitration awards. 
So if you have the resources, I can actually mobilize the state's coercive powers for my own end against others. It's a means of controlling others and, of course, also defense against the state. And the last but not least is what I call legal arbitrage, which is somehow inherent to any legal system. Law is general, it's ambiguous, it very often conflicts with different rules. There are lots of frictions which you can exploit if you know how to do this. And so you can engage in a lot of legal arbitrage, including picking and choosing the law by which you wish to be governed to escape the reach of political governance or collective governance of others. So what I'm trying to show in this new book is how these broader structural features of our capitalist legal system allow capital to win the game time and again. So I'm also hopeful. There's, at the beginning, when I wrote this book, I went to my faculty and I said, there's no way out. This is just no exit. <laughs> yet, yet with other, as the Russians said, it was a joke in the late Soviet Union, there's no exit. Um, so they said, I can't write a book like this. So I'm struggling, and so I'm learning, to, I'm hoping to learn from you. I want to learn more about how we can get out. So in the final chapter, I'm also starting, of course, with this notion, well, we're in the midst of a crisis. Crisis are always moments for change. Where can I see change happening? And I see, I think there's a lot of potential for change if we also think about the frictions in the existing legal systems and the potentiality of many of the institutions we already have to reconfigure them into something else. So trusts. Land trusts can be used to protect the old estate owners. It can also be set up for cooperative housing or to protect the land of indigenous people. These institutions, I don't want to say that they're neutral, but they're versatile. The key will be to ensure that we use them for certain purposes and that they will not be easily repurposed for different ends. And um, let me just end here and say I'm hoping we can build it that, um, together and I'm looking forward to learning from